welcome to the second to last course on Rust options you will ever need. No, this is not a two-part series, it's just not that good and thus I recommend you consult additional material if you really want to master options. Let us start out by looking at what an option is. An option is defined as an enum. It can either be a none or a sum variant. The sum variant holds data of arbitrary type t. Okay, I guess so far we've made no grave mistakes, so let's just keep going. To start out, we can define an option as the variant sum 41. No, I guess that's not quite the right. Better, but let's avoid any confusion here. Yep, that's it. Sum 42 has its counterpart, a variable containing none. And because none is totally unaware of its own type, we add a turbo fish to explicitly declare the type. You probably know that you can call isSum to find out whether the option is the sum variant, and same with isNone. But did you know that you can simply call unwrap on an option to get to its contained value? Yes, you did know that, you probably did know that. Of course, calling unwrap on a none value will crash your program and panic. Therefore, instead of just calling unwrap on an option, which is a truly barbaric act, you can use expect to panic in a more fancy way. Let's get real here. Panicking all the time is way less fun than it sounds, so we should probably use some grown-up functions. How about unwrap or, which lets you provide a fallback value in case you unwrap a none value? Or unwrap or else, if you'd rather have a closure return the fallback value? Or if you want to be lazy, and I know that's exactly what you want to do, you can rely on the default constructor of the wrapped type. That's extraction, but why in the world would you want to extract a value if it is so nicely packed in that option? Let's look at how to make things more complicated with transformation, because that's why we learn Rust. If you wanted a language with simple syntax and high performance that allows us to move quickly, we'd all be writing Go. If you're not happy with the options you got, and you want to see quick results, OK OR is exactly the right function for you. It converts a sum into an OK and a none into an error. And in case you want more fancy pipe characters in your code, because your salary is directly coupled to the amount of closures you commit to production, OK or else lets you provide a function that generates your error content. Now, let's get to more useful stuff. With transpose, you can transpose an option of a result to a result of an option. Who uses functions like this? If you are already on the next level, you're probably not dealing with options of results, but you're dealing with options of options. As long as you're not trading options, you should be totally fine though. Flatten lets you reduce the level of nested options by one level. It can only be used if your options are actually nested, and that's how it avoids ever panicking. So make sure to always nest your options, because that's the way to avoid panicking. And hopefully, compile time optimization will do the rest. Once you've nested enough options, you probably have no idea what you're actually wrapping. And there's always the chance that you didn't actually wrap anything. By the way, if you do that with Christmas presents, you will be kicked out by your girlfriend, but don't worry, Rust's got you covered. There are operations you can use on an option even though you have no idea whether there is some contained value or not. One of them is map. As we saw with unwrap, you can append an OR to map as well if you want to provide a default value. But don't ask me why you have to provide the OR value first in the mapping function second. Some of Rust's design decisions are just beyond me. Again, to drive up your closure count, feel free to add an else. If you want to declutter your options, filter is for you. In case there is some data left in your option, you can safely convert it to a none if the content fails to pass your predicate. And don't forget to put your asterisk in the predicate body, because other than map, filter takes a reference to your data. Oh, thank god the compiler gives halfway decent advice, otherwise I could have never fixed this piece of sh** code that ChatGPT gave me. So you think this was quite a lot already? You think we're done here? Nope, not even close. You haven't seen shit yet. Welcome to logical operators. Logical operators work exactly the way you would expect them to, except that you get an option instead of a boolean value back. Sum and none yields none, sum or none yields the sum variant. You think the Rust developers couldn't possibly have messed this one up? Oh boy, are you wrong. Sum and sum yields the second sum, while sum or sum yields the first sum value. 
And before any of you start a discussion about short circuiting in the comments, I don't want to hear it. This is just terrible design. You want to hear a funny story? Just like with unwrap, OK and map, you can append an OR to AND as well as OR to provide fallback values. This makes the syntax less readable than embedding Haskell in a Fortran 77 program. No, just kidding. That's not actually a thing, and I'm really glad it isn't. But what the Rust has brought to the table, as always, is the ELSE. However, they left out the AND ELSE, because that would be stupid, right? I actually have no idea why AND ELSE doesn't exist, except for that it sounds like ass. Instead, there is AND then, which rings like an angel's voice on the first warm day in spring. The closure here takes the value that is wrapped inside the option and returns another option. You could ask, is AND then really needed when we have map already to operate on the values inside the sum variant? Yes, it is, because of fallibil fallibility. Fallibility. Ah, yes, exactly. Fallibility. Map represents an operation that can never fail. That's why the closure doesn't return an option, but a value which will then automatically be wrapped in a sum variant. And then, on the other hand, takes a closure that returns an option, which can also be none. One last chapter and we're finally done with this nonsense. Modifying an option in place. The first option is to call insert on an option, which will insert the given value into the option. You didn't guess that one, huh? The old value is dropped. The return value of the insert operation is a mutable reference to the new contained value. It is a bit illegal to fidget with the value after handing it to the option, but it's not as if Rust would care about ownership or so. Get or insert does exactly what it says. If there's something in the option, it will get you a reference to the content. If there is nothing inside, it will insert a value and also return a reference. And if you've been wondering whether all these nuns should have a turbofish type annotation, yes they should have, but I am a lazy bastard. And also, time is money and I have neither to give away for free. By the way, if you want to have your pipe characters, the Rust developers played a trick on you. You have to use with instead of else, because both phrases are equally unintuitive. Ok ok, I admit, I trolled you a bit. There's actually one more chapter to go. Transferring ownership. And if you've ever written Rust, you know that ownership is the single most messed up the single most important concept in Rust. You can take a value and leave a none. Root. You can also take a value and replace it with a different value. Also root. Now I really hope that you find that knowledge useful, because I don't find it useful at all. And I just wasted hours on learning this, and then some more by producing this video. And if you're still watching by now, it's not optional to like and subscribe.